All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Agile DevOps DFW. Today we can talk about um, cycle time, real world client um, who was able to apply what we uh, what we discovered together to reduce cycle time from maybe five and a half months to about one week in a six month time frame. And we're lucky to have Adrian Galarza, the Scrum Master of the team. And without him, none of this would have happened. So he's going to tell you what it felt like to be in his shoes and what adjustments he saw the team make. Um, and I hope we can all learn something from his experience. So welcome everyone. Um, let's get started. Uh, about six years ago, October 2014, I co-created Agile DevOps DFW with two of my friends, Victor James and Fred Olson in this Barnes & Noble, Beltline and Tollway. Uh, I Googled what happened in October 2014, and the only thing I could find out was San Francisco Giants. The Giants uh, won the major championship. Nothing else eventful happened that, that year or that month. All right. So why do we, uh, you know, what's the focus of our group? We, we uh, explore Agile DevOps interconnections. Um, first Thursday of the month, 6 o'clock Central, we just added a second time slot, third Thursday, 11 a.m., Next month, so our next meetup is going to be the third Thursday of October. We have an uh, interesting speaker, interesting topic, and we are talking about edge applications. I had no clue what edge applications was or were. I Googled it. But anyway, what we're going to talk about is next uh, uh, in our next meetup is what are edge applications and how can agile teams apply or harness edge applications or deliver edge applications using Kubernetes and Docker um, uh, in a post-COVID era. So it's an exciting topic. It's not the typical, you know, processy, touchy-feely kind of stuff. It's more technical. Uh, uh, we welcome speakers, especially uh, speakers on more technical topics. That's not where my network is strong. Um, and if you miss any of our webinars, especially in the post-COVID era, any of our meetups, since we've gone purely virtual, you can always go to our YouTube channel and then you can watch our videos there. All right, uh, that's a little bit about ourselves, um, a little bit about Smooth Apps. Uh, these are all our partners. Um, one of our partners, uh, these are all entrepreneurs. They have their own companies. They are. They have all been vetted by Scrum.org. They are all current or former Scrum.org professional Scrum trainers and we help each other out. Uh, so chances are, if you have a need in any part of the world, we can find a good Scrum.org trainer that we are compatible with and we can get you training, coaching, consulting, help in whatever location you want, right? Uh, and in fact, one of our my mentors and my uh, partners, Mark Nonneman, is on the, uh, on the webinar today. All right, a uh, little bit about Smooth Apps. Uh, so we are an agile training, coaching, consulting firm, and then... Uh, we have lots of content on our YouTube channel. So if, if uh, the message we communicate, our way of thinking resonates with you, then take a look at our YouTube channel, subscribe. You, you'll find lots of content there. Um, we've been active on our blogs. So some of our recent blogs, uh, 10 ways to strengthen your Scrum fundamentals. How do you get your first big break on a Scrum team? the professional Scrum product owner job description and 10 ways to enable self-organization. So we try to post blogs that are relevant to our clients. So if you're interested, take a look, lots of free resources on our website. Uh, we've been uh, more active on LinkedIn. Uh, Janie is doing a fantastic job uh, curating content and you know, um, publishing our content. We've got quotations, inspiring quotes. We post our videos and blogs. So. If uh, our content resonates with you, follow us on LinkedIn and you'll stay up to date with our latest uh, events and so on. All right. Uh, something I'm passionate about, Agile for Patriots. I'm a very grateful immigrant and uh, I try to pay my debt back to this beautiful country. And one way I try to do that is uh, by giving back to US military veterans and, and families who have given so much for us, uh, to us, kept all of us safe during good times and bad times. So what I did was a few years ago, I co-founded Agile for Patriots with Greg Gomel, a friend of mine. And what we did was we started offering free Agile training, coaching, uh, mentoring, and uh, pract practicum experience or internships to US military veterans and spouses. And 
Adrian, who is the Scrum Master, who is going to be speaking today, was actually the graduate of our first cohort. So this experiment works. We have taken awesome talent from the U.S. military and military families. We've taught them Scrum, and they've become awesome Scrum Masters. Um, so if you have a desire to give back and show appreciation to military families, uh, here are some ways in which you can help us. You can give a short lightning talk. You could... You don't have to make any slides. You can just show up uh, for a Q&A session, ask me anything session. You can give some short presentations. You can offer internships, job opportunities. If you don't have time, but you have some money, then you can also donate at agileforpatriots.org. And there's a donate button there. All right, so that's a little bit about Agile for Patriots. Some housekeeping. Uh, everybody's gonna be in listen mode only. I have the, uh, your, the chat panel open. So if anybody wants to, uh, I would love for you to communicate along the way. I'll be monitoring the chat panel where possible. I'll answer. We'll take questions along the way. If, uh, if it's appropriate, more appropriate, we'll take them at the end. If we run out of time, you can contact us offline using LinkedIn and we'll answer your question offline. All right. Um, that's a little bit about uh, housekeeping. Let's talk about Adrian. Adrian impressed me right from the get-go. July 2017 is the first time I met him in Collin County Community College. I was doing intro to Agile, and during a break, uh, that class was a complete disaster. <laughs> that was not one of my finer moments. But during a break, Adrian came to me, and you know, he in a very kind, compassionate, loving way, and he gave me, he started coaching me. That I mean, would it be okay if we organized this exercise like this? He gave me some amazing feedback. I said, yes, thank you. And I knew I was in the presence of greatness. You know, there's something exceptional about Adrian. You'll understand if you have a chance to interact with him. So. I won't read all the bullets here, but I want to uh, I want to talk a little bit about Adrian and why he exemplifies uh, the essence of you know U.S. military uh, veterans or uh, military families. Uh, one thing I noticed about U.S. military veterans is that they have been under tremendous stress, and many times they have made uh, life or death decisions, literally, uh, and maybe offline. You know, Adrian can tell you about some of his more challenging situations he has faced. Why is that important in a scrum master or why is that important in an agile coach? I feel that uh, being a change agent causes uh, you to become a lightning rod for all the fears and anxieties of people who are terrified of change. As human beings, we are hardwired to be terrified of change because back from our you know, cave caveman days, we had that heightened sense of um, either hypervigilance or sense of threat, threat awareness. That's kind of hard, hardwired. And we project fears onto any change. And when you're a scrum master, and what you're doing is you're trying to challenge the status quo and you become the lightning rod for a lot of things. People hate you before you open your mouth from the time you, they see you for the first time. And what I have seen is that the people who thrive the most are people who don't get scared too easily. And I, that's something I've noticed with U.S. military veterans. They don't get scared too easily. And so when people are freaking out around you, if you have someone who's steady, who's calm, no matter what's thrown at them, they're able to stay calm, not take it personally, then they can guide the team through lots of turbulence. I've personally seen Adrian do that for more than three years. I've seen multiple U.S. military veterans do that our, uh, over many years. And the best thing is none of them had any agile experience prior to Agile for Patriots. And that's the way I like it because when I get people who have experience, it takes me so much time to format the hard drive and erase all the crap that's in their mind when it comes to Agile. Um, it, it's, it's hopeless. But when I have someone fresh who's open, who's hungry, like a U.S. military veteran, it, it, it's much better. Anyway, so that's, good. that's the end of my sales pitch for U.S. military veterans. Uh, if you can, hire one. It's probably going to work out better for you. I'm not going to bore you a lot. Kind words, Robbie. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for your service. Uh, most of you know me probably. I'm a uh, Scrum.org professional Scrum trainer and the founder of Smooth Apps. <clears throat> uh, let's go into uh, the topic, cycle time journey. I have a question for you. So maybe some executives, when you talk to them about Agile or Scrum, they might say, yes, I want to squeeze more juice from my Agile teams. I will use Agile. I will use Scrum. I will get twice the work from half the people in half the time. And all I want is I want you to double velocity in one quarter, chop, chop, chop. That's what I want. And now 
you are an agile coach and you are trying to persuade your executive to fixate on something or focus on something other than velocity you are trying to influence them to say hey you know that bright shiny object called velocity i have a brighter shinier object and it's called cycle time uh, can we go chase that bright brighter shinier object what would you say to the executive especially in a post covid era to make them uh, more interested in optimizing cycle time as opposed to increasing velocity so that's my question to you uh, type your answer in the chat panel don't think too much uh, maybe 30 to i'll just give you 30 to 60 seconds here's the scenario you have an executive he's fixated on doubling velocity he wants to do twice the work in half the time with half the people and you are trying to explain to that person why in a post covid era it might be more valuable to the business to optimize cycle time instead of velocity what would you say please type your answers in the chat window why should an executive care about cycle time and not velocity in a post covid era Okay, starting to see the answers come in. All right, so let's see what kind of answers we got. So Mark uh Mark answer is velocity is unitless it has no accuracy or precision cycle time measures how long it takes to deliver we can look at time variability and predictability eric says decrease time to market expedite value to users and stakeholders animesh says pick each user story at a time see it all the way to done Um, and Eric is saying short cycle time helps get feedback sooner. Mike is saying flow of value to the customer is better. Outcome is better than output from the velocity. And Mike is saying it gets time. It gets items being completed faster through all stages of development. Faster feedback potential. Awesome. So especially in a post COVID era, customer usage patterns have completely changed. And so what got us here. may not get us there the, the backlog items that you were working on in november of 2019 maybe even jan of 2019 what you thought was valuable to customers in jan of 2019 or jan november december 2019 or jan of 2020 might no longer be as valuable in october of 2020 so when we have short feedback loops we implement a quick experiment we see is it still valuable to the customer if it is then we can nurture that idea if it's not let's be ruthless and let's get rid of that idea right so that's why cycle time is important um in a post covid more so than a po- in a post covid era than before all right how did we define cycle time there are gazillion definitions of cycle time the way in this in the context of this uh, webinar what we are defining cycle time as the number of calendar days it took our scrum team or adrian scrum team to go to take an item a product backlog item from sprint ready no sorry a sprint ready product backlog item to go from active to deployed and usable in production so it was not dark in production it was actually usable for customers and and users target users and adrian if i misspeak at any time please do chime in and correct me okay uh, i want to provide some context adrian is going to share Ten adjustments in this webinar. Um, now, a word of caution: if you were to try and follow all the ten steps that Adrian shares in this webinar, it is quite possible that you may not get the desired results. One is because there is no cookie cutter re- recipe, right? What might work in Adrian's context might not even work in another context in another Scrum team in the same company. So you've got to realize that organizations are complex adaptive systems. 
and you can't just copy paste. There's no blueprint. But there's a second, there's a second picture. Uh, this was in year four of a four-year agile enablement effort. So a lot of thing ha things happened before and a lot of uh, things were happening in the surrounding ecosystem without which I, uh, I don't think these 10 steps would have worked. So we don't have time to go through everything that happened, but I'll, I'll give you a quick flyby of what happened in 2017, 2018, and 2019, and 2020 in the surrounding ecosystem. All right. Uh, from a fundamental perspective, the CIO of the company was very uh, committed to just using the fundamentals. Uh, very ethical person. He did not want to change the Agile manifesto or principles or come up with the, uh, their own version of Agile. They did not want to come up with their own software delivery framework. So their idea was, let's just use what is already in the industry. We are not so unique that we have to come up with our own software delivery framework, all right? So that saved us a lot of time and money instead of trying to customize and build our own framework, okay? We had a whole bunch of training, uh, and I'll just uh, uh, give you a quick overview of the trainings that we did. Um, a lot of what we learned when it comes to cycle time was actually from uh, my mentor, Mark Noneman, who's on the, on the webinar, and also when it comes to quality. So Mark Noneman, taught us uh, Kanban uh, system design. Uh, so he, he taught us principles of Kanban. And he also basically taught us about defect prevention and quality assurance. And both of those ideas that Mark taught us have been very crucial in implementing what we did. Uh, also, Mark has a really good video on the different types of agile metrics. And we used uh, that video. If you haven't seen it, it's available free of cost on the scum.org YouTube channel. You should, you should watch that because uh, what we learned from Mark helped us design our EBM dashboards, evidence-based management dashboards, and to distinguish between different kinds of metrics and uh, differentiate between output metrics, outcome metrics, and so on. So anyway, uh, all of the training that was that is mentioned here was given either by me myself or by a scrum.org uh, trainer like Mark Noneman or management 3.0 and PSD was done by Rich Vysotsky. Uh, BDD was done by uh, Chuck Cucumber. Behavior Driven Development was done by Chuck Suschek and PSU was done by Gary Padretti. So all the training uh, is very compatible with the scrum.org way of thinking, all right? Uh, and then we use the scrum.org uh, assessments to validate the theoretical knowledge. Uh, we have key leaders in the company, sometimes entire scrum teams, and sometimes key leaders on a pretty much every or almost every scrum team who has passed uh, scrum.org exams to validate that they get the theory. And then we created a bunch of playbooks. We have a scrum events and activities playbook. We created a scrum quick launch playbook. Uh, we created a product, we are using product ownership playbook, uh, release planning pay playbook, and we, we have evidence-based management tools and dashboards and playbooks, all right? We've got a whole bunch of events uh, across the whole company uh, that occur on a cadence. So we have scrum scrums in the morning, we have some kind of a meeting to align the business organization in terms of the roadmap, we have lunch and learns, we have a meeting called Paths to Agility where we celebrate and appreciate agile champions, those role models who are demonstrating the behavior that we want to see more of in the company. And we have executive reviews. What I love about this company is the CEO of the company shows up to the executive review and asks the scrum team, what do you need? How can I help? Uh, th that's very powerful. That's servant leadership. What do you need? How can I help? Okay, next. What do you need? How can I help? So, you can see a lot of plumbing has been done across um, different parts of the organization. And we have different communities. We have the Agile Community of Practice. We have Architecture Community of Practice, Scrum Master COP, Servant Leader COP. So we've got all kinds of things in place, all right? Um, so uh, that's just the surrounding ecosystem. A lot of work has been done. Let's talk about Adrian's team. So before we began, before Adrian got involved, uh, they had a very passionate. Uh, they had a very passionate person who believed in Scrum and started adoption of Scrum without any external request from anyone in management. Uh, and she was actually she had a full time job on the team, but she was doing double duty and she was working really crazy hours. Uh, so she was working as a Scrum master plus taking care of a lot of other things. And in fact, she was 
key. She was very key in the success uh, that that the team has enjoyed. She is one of those leaders who may not lead from the front, uh, has no desire for any publicity, but without her, everything falls back, right? So there, she's she's like one of those invisible locker room leaders, and we are so blessed to have her. Uh, because uh, you know we were not focusing on that team. Uh, naturally they were doing the best they can and they made huge progress but they were still struggling they had high whip they had high cycle time they were struggling with self organization so when we began we started making some adjustments we uh, even the product owner was kind of uh, part time so we added a, a dedicated product owner and we added adrian as a full time scrum master and then uh, we started increasing focus on refinement and readiness of the backlog items and then there began our journey, 10 key adjustments over six months that took cycle time from five and a half months to about one week. And now I'm gonna hand over to Adrian and he will tell he will walk you through the journey. So Adrian, over to you. Thanks Ravi. Uh, one of the things that I really like what you said is that a lot of these things might not work exactly the same for everybody, but I'm really hoping that maybe you'll find one or two things here that can help your teams. So to start it off uh, in April, uh, we'd have, we had already come quite a long way by this time. Uh, some of our refinement was pretty good. You know, we, we had a supporting ecosystem, but we were not that quick to respond to change yet. And uh, we were finding it kind of challenging to even have one potentially shippable increment at the end of the sprint. Uh, what the challenge was is that we had some uh, unclear dependencies. The team was pretty good at doing refinement and figuring out what the acceptance criteria was, uh, doing some mock-ups and having a good idea of what they were building, but we weren't considering dependencies with other teams uh, quite so much. That, that would kind of happen on the moment, kind of on the fly. And uh, it was kind of similar also for the testing effort. So the impact was that uh, we would end up thinking that we're done with uh, some of the PVIs, but then we're scratching our head thinking, hey, uh, we didn't think about this other team that we have an integration with, and now we need them to work on this at this moment. Uh, can they get it done? Can they shift really quickly? And obviously that team was not very happy to have an unexpected request out of the blue for an emergency change. And uh, it was similar with the testing effort. We were. Uh, thinking we're done with the PVI and now we want to get some of our business partners to test the uh, functionality to make sure it meets their needs. But we weren't doing a very good job of forecasting at that point. So it would be like, hey, Ravi, uh, we're done with this function. Can you, can you test it? Can you be done in the next two hours? And uh, so that way we can deploy. And obviously that's very frustrating for people. And uh, it's very chaotic. So what we started is doing, uh, during our backlog refinement, uh, we started asking the question, what are some of the dependencies that we have? Uh, do we need to contact another team and involve them in our sprint planning so that they have an understanding of what we're gonna need from them and then we can get a commitment to, uh, to work on the mutual things that are needed. Uh, we started uh, in including more detailed acceptance tests from our business stakeholders because at some points, there was things that uh, we weren't thinking of that we needed. Uh, so having them involved, they often brought their business expertise uh, to the discussion to help us identify those things that we might not have thought of. And uh, that was really helpful because now our, uh, our developers knew exactly what they needed to build or they were much closer. I guess you never really know exactly until you get it done, but uh, we were definitely much closer to that. So. That was the first month. And then the next month, um, we, uh, you know, it was kind of an escalation. Like we find something at the retro that we want to fix. We take corrective action. And there's always something else in the next ret next few retros that we're going to identify where we want to get better. So this is uh, basically that journey. The, the next uh, big challenge for that month was we started realizing that, uh, only one of our team members knew how to do a uh, build and deploy process in, in uh, Visual Studio and DevOps. And we found that out because uh, he had to be out for a week. So then all of a sudden, we are 
just asking people, we are asking the architects, hey, uh, can you help us out? Can you do this for us? And generally it was kind of on the fly as well. It was not really planned. It was like, uh, we need, we need a, a build. Can you do it like now? <laughs> and uh, so there was a lot of frustration for that as well. And then another, uh, at the same time, we were working on this other integrated product that was built in Java, but we didn't have any Java skills in the team. And there was a couple of other developers that had uh, Java knowledge. And so we were totally relying on them. And at that point in the journey, there was multiple teams asking these two developers to do a lot of different changes. Uh, so we uh, uh, started with, uh, we asked one of our developers, we asked our development team, but somebody, does anybody know Java? Can anybody pick up the skills? And we had a couple of developers that volunteered. And as the uh, supporting Java team helped us out, our developers uh, worked side by side with them to understand and to learn Java. And uh, it took a little while, maybe a, a couple of months, but our uh, pretty sharp developers picked up the skills and now we don't rely on any external teams. Now we have that skill within our team. So then moving on to the next month, um, we found that even after coordinating a little bit more on the testing effort, we weren't doing a good enough job yet. So it was kind of informal. At this point, we didn't have a um, very formal uh, agreement with our business unit on uh, what was going to be needed. You know, like our, our team was starting to get a lot faster at developing functionality. And uh, initially, the way that our business unit was supporting us was kind of on an ad hoc manner, but slightly planned. And uh, because we were trying to get so much more done, we ended up uh, speaking with the director or our business unit and uh, getting commitment that we would have more support up to like 50% of capacity from one person, plus our PO, plus another person. That way we had enough uh, people available and we could plan a little bit better what was gonna be needed from them. And uh, that would help us avoid delays because we're finding that as we develop lots of things, we have uh, six developers. So there was like almost daily, there was something that was done that needed testing. And uh, often we would encounter delays, but once we got that agreement in place, uh, we started to uh, be able to have them more uh, meaningful conversations on, you know, what do we need to test? Uh, when do we expect to need them to test? How will they know when they're ready to start? Uh, you know, when the, uh, there was times when there's other business priorities and they wouldn't be available, but we could work around that by planning and working together. And uh, another important thing too was part of that collaboration, we wanted to know from our testers, hey, uh, what can we do to help you be able to test easier? Sometimes I was providing some data that uh, our development team uh, pulled with queries or, you know, numerous other ways, but it was a very uh, collaborative environment once we got this in place. Yeah, and Adrian, I want to add something here. Uh, for other people who might be helping with agile enablement, I've been doing this for about 10 years. I've done this for companies with five scrum teams, and I've done this for companies with 350 scrum teams. In fact, one of, uh, you know, Mark Norman and I, we work uh, as agile coaches, enterprise agile coaches for a 10,000 person publicly traded company, multi-billion dollar company with 350 teams. So the point I'm making is irrespective of the size of the company, publicly traded, privately held, doesn't matter the technology, doesn't matter the industry, doesn't matter the size. There's something that happens almost like clockwork. In the beginning, when a company tries agile enablement, the reason they often try is business says IT is too slow. And then what happens like clockwork, I'm telling you this is like 10 years of companies uh, within three to six sprints. What happens is the uh, agile delivery team start humming like a well-oiled machine. And they are cranking out uh, done items and done increments every sprint. Now the bottleneck has shift, shifted. The bottleneck has moved further along the supply chain. Now the problem is business cannot keep up with IT. First, it used to be IT can't keep up with business. But 
Now what's happened is business used to be accustomed to one year big bang releases where they would drop everything and do some massive UAT. But now the pressure has shifted because every two weeks, at least one scrum team is delivering something and they're telling business, okay, you asked for this, I got it. Let's test it, let's deploy it to production, let's move on. And business like, whoa, 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 I've got a real job, right? So uh, the, the bottleneck will shift through the supply chain of your company. And I'm so happy with Adrian that he was able, you know, he had very collaborative business partners. And instead of fighting with IT, they actually collaborated and said, okay, let's, let's work together. So I'm just giving you a heads up. If people have not experienced this, I'm just letting you know that this may happen. So don't be surprised or blindsided. If you're doing your job, this, this should happen. All right, Adrian. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Ravi. And I, I think if I reflect back on the journey of our team, it's almost like uh, the bottleneck followed the whole process from the beginning to end, right? It's like initially refinement might be a bottleneck because we don't do a good enough job in the beginning as we get used to the way that we operate as a scrum team. And then it might be development as people are picking up teams, figuring out how to, I'm sorry, picking up skills. Uh, also figuring out how to work well together as a team then testing and then possibly deployment and so on. So I think you described it very well there. Um, so uh, around June, uh, by this point, as I mentioned a little while ago, we were uh, pretty consistent at deploying at least once a sprint. Uh, what was happening, what Big Bang deployments for us means here is that we had maybe 12, 10 uh, user stories and the afternoon before the sprint review, finally everything's done, everything is in QA, and now we're saying, hey, uh, business partners and testers, can you uh, validate everything in QA even though you've been testing all along? And now I'll do regression testing, make sure everything's working together the way that it should now that we got it in a uh, product-like environment. And uh, that was creating a lot of frustration because obviously, some of the regression testing when you're still doing manual testing can take a long time and it's very stressful. A lot of scenarios, people want to do a good job. So they want to make sure they have uh, positive and negative test cases covered. And uh, we weren't really allowing that uh, so well. So they were kind of becoming waterfall sprints to where we delivered one big thing at the end. And this was also putting a lot of risk on uh, us being able to complete our sprint goal there was a, a few sprints there that um, the night before at like 6.30 p.m., 7 p.m., finally were able to deploy and our sprint review is first thing the next morning. And uh, that was either we're gonna be 0% done or we're gonna be 100% done. So man, some nerve wracking moments there. <laughs> so I think one of the big things that was happening is, uh, you know, not just the risk of missing our sprint goal, there was a lot of potential disappointment for uh, our stakeholders when they're also stressing out, like, what are we going to get this sprint? Because uh, as Robbie mentioned, we have uh, evidence-based management scoreboards where people can kind of track our progress. Our stakeholders can uh, go to this website and see how we're doing so far. So they kept seeing 0%, 0%. And uh, it's getting a little uh, nerve wracking for them as well not only for them, but there's also a team morale issue. So imagine how stressful it would be for our whole development team, our testers, our product owner, everybody on that last day when we're barely making it, barely getting done. So we uh, had a lot of good conversations that a couple of retros trying to figure out how do we do smaller deployments, try to evenly space out. Maybe we can do two deployments to start out with, do 50%, 50%. That makes it easier on everybody. And then another thing that we identified from a, a good learning experience is that we had some risky uh, user stories, PBIs, that we started kind of late in the sprint. And uh, once we, we started at like maybe halfway through the sprint and realized that it was a tough one, but then it had also a dependency, an unknown dependency at that time on some of the other uh, PBIs that we had during that sprint. So that risky one was very iffy on if it would get done. In the end, we ended up pulling it off. 
but we learned from that experience by saying, uh, these user stories that are risky, that have dependencies, let's do those at the beginning of the sprint. And then that way we can overcome that risk and we'll know where we are sooner in the sprint instead of waiting until the end. Very cool. Uh, Adrian, I have a question here. This reminds me of an exercise we do in the uh, Scrum.org Scale Professional Scrum Workshop where we try to visualize dependencies uh, between um, between items. Now, in, in, that, in that workshop, we just used arrows. Uh, do you have any techniques on uh, techniques that you found useful in visualizing uh, cross PBI dependencies? Was it verbal? Was it a tool? Was it a little yeah. bit of both? Um, so my team is uh, really responsive more to like uh, individuals and interactions instead of uh, processes and tools, you know. And what we found that works really well for us is just having that conversation when we're doing refinement and making sure that we identify dependencies. Sometimes they still pop up and you're not expecting them, but we try to minimize that. And then another thing that we do is we use Azure DevOps as our uh, work tracking tool. And uh, so our PBIs, there's capability to tag them and we tag them as uh, dependency or risk or something so that uh, we know uh, what we're, so we can easily identify them when we're looking at them. And then additionally, we do one more practice that's not a necessarily a scrum uh, event, but halfway through our sprint, uh, we start on Tuesdays. And uh, so the, the Tuesday or on two week sprints, a Tuesday, a weekend to our sprint, we do a pre planning session. So we put a very tentative plan together on what the next sprint would look like. Uh, we have a discussion like, is there dependencies? Is there any other things that we have to clear up? Is there any more refinement that we need to do? Because now we're a little bit closer to understanding what that next sprint is going to look like. So we try to identify some of those things that we need to figure out. And by doing it a week out from that next sprint, that gives us plenty of time to go find those answers and try to identify those risks. Very good. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, the reason I brought this up is, you know, dependencies are probably the single biggest killer of, of scaling of Scrum. And I've been in so many companies where we spent so much time trying to understand tools like Rally or Jira and try to figure out how the tool can, how we can map dependencies using the tool that the tool became our master instead of being our slave. And sometimes the tool can't help, just human beings can talk. So anyway, I, mm -hmm. I'm glad, I, I just wanted to unpack that for others so that you know, if you're struggling with the tool uh, and it's not working, maybe stop using the tool, just start talking. Thanks, Adrian. Sure. Okay, so in, uh, in July, uh, we've been working remotely for a while and uh, we found ourselves drifting a little bit, you know, not being physically close together, brought on some challenges that were starting to manifest. And uh, some of those really, I, I put them in a bucket of like holding ourselves accountable. What we noticed is like refinement meetings. Uh, sometimes, you know, we would schedule them for an hour uh, it would be a really interesting topic, really, uh, we'd be deep inside uh, user story acceptance criteria to try to figure it out. And we weren't quite done yet with 10 minutes out or five minutes out. So then that one hour meeting turned into an hour and 15, maybe an hour and a half. And it was really uh, frustrating our whole team. I think we saw the benefits of continuing, but at the same time, when you want to get your real work done like a developer they actually want to be writing code it was kind of frustrating i think for a lot of our team members saying you, you told me this was going to be a one hour meeting and we're still here an hour and 20 minutes later so uh the other thing that was related to that was that you know as you're working on a user story a lot of that collaboration and interaction that you're having with the uh, business unit Sometimes as you learn more, as the developers are working on that PBI, they realize there's a better way to do something than what had originally been planned in the acceptance criteria. So they would talk with the product owner, they figure out a better way, they said, all right, uh, let's go that route. The product owner would agree to it, uh, but what we were not doing is updating our tool, our user story on DevOps, 
So now we have a better product on this PVI, right? And our product owner likes it better. But when our tester goes and looks at the acceptance criteria and what's expected that was built, they're looking at the user story. They might not have been involved in that conversation with that single developer and the product owner. So now when they compare the user story that they can read versus the outcome, it didn't always match up. So when that happened, now we're trying to figure out why a bug was logged. Uh, there was frustration. So we figured out uh, we better talk about this during the next retro and try and figure out how do we do this better. It was a pretty simple solution. So we just agreed that anytime there's a change to the acceptance criteria or somebody figures out a better way to do something, uh, we just make sure that we sync up our user stories so that everybody is uh, in alignment so that we're not wasting our testers time or, uh, you know, causing these bugs to be written and wasting more time. So far that uh, worked pretty well. So <clears throat> uh, yeah, the, the next month was also kind of related to holding ourselves accountable. Uh, we were uh, distracted and multitasking in meetings because this uh, remote work was new to us. We didn't really have many people work from home in the past before COVID. Uh, it was kind of a learning curve and I think people adapted pretty well to sharing uh, items or like screens, like slides or refinement sessions and things, but everybody was video shy. And if nobody can see what you're doing, it's very easy to try to be more productive and try to listen. And maybe I'll do something else at the same time. I'll finish writing a user story. I'll start uh, writing some automated tests or something along those lines. Uh, but what we're really seeing is that and refinement sessions is where it became the most evident because uh, somebody would ask a question and they would say, hey, uh, Adrian, what do you think about, uh, you know, having a blue background on this screen? Something really simple. And then Adrian would take like three seconds of silence and say, uh, can you rephrase your question? And that was a really simple question, right? There's not much to rephrase there. So we knew there was a lot of distraction going on. <clears throat> During the retro, we talked about it and we realized how much time was being lost and how much repetition was being done because people were fully focused in the moment and uh, we were losing a lot of efficiency and productivity. And we saw that even in like daily scrums, uh, somebody would ask something that was already covered thoroughly in a refinement session and they would ask about it again because they weren't paying attention in the past. And um, I think one of the things that I give kudos to the team about too is that they're very open-minded and uh, willing to hear feedback and uh, everybody realized that we could do better. And uh, so we agreed to turn on our cameras and really focus so we can get out of there quicker and uh, be more efficient. Yeah, Adrian, I want to share a couple of things here. One is I remember being in a call with the CIO. And one thing I wanted to share is we complemented the Scrum framework uh, and added a formal role called the servant leader. So every Scrum team has a director level person whose job is to remove any impediments that the Scrum master is unable to remove because the company is not responding. Maybe the Scrum Master doesn't have either the formal power or the social standing, right? So we had that every Scrum team in the company has got a, one director who's tagged as the servant leader and the buck stops with them to remove impediments uh, that the Scrum Master can't remove. So, you know, we have a bi-weekly session with all the servant leaders and the CIO was coaching us to say, look, in a post-COVID era, please be kind and compassionate with people because I'm paraphrasing here, because people are coming from different economic backgrounds. I remember when I came to the US 20 years ago, I used to live in a one bedroom house. So you could be in a situation where someone has a one bedroom house, there's a crying baby in the background, there's one child doing homework, one child doing remote schooling, and there's, you know, and that person may feel self-conscious turning on the camera. So the CIO actually practices self-deprecatory humor uh, whenever you hear a baby crying in the background or your dog barking, as you're probably hearing in my background, 
you know he mm. modeled humility kindness and love and and he coached all of us to be kind to our fellow human beings and i think he sets the tone for the company and slowly because i feel people were not scared the way uh, you know background noise it's okay there's a background noise we are all humans it's okay we are in a pandemic once in a lifetime pandemic they i feel that a lot of those surrounding factors made it safe for people to turn on their camera uh, and not be self conscious about the imperfections right so that's one thing i want to tell i want to say one other thing there's something unique about adrian's team and i've been thinking for for one year why is it so why are they so different from other scrum teams i've coached whenever we give them any feedback i can see i can hear some silence and i can hear them processing i can hear them processing and they usually the answer is okay coach we'll discuss it as a team and we'll get back contrast this with other teams before i finish the sentence or someone else has finished the sentence someone on the team is ready to attack that idea they are very defensive and i was wondering why is it that adrian's team is willing to consider ideas is willing to uh if you explain the why adrian's team is going to actually either find a way to get to the why or will they will try out your idea i have never heard adrian's team reject an idea from the get go and i was wondering what the heck is going on and i still don't know the answer it's a complex adaptive system but i have a hypothesis i feel there are it, it all started with three leaders of the team adrian the product owner and the person who was the previous technical project manager slash business analyst i feel that all three of these people are kind people they are compassionate they don't get triggered easily they don't get defensive easily and i feel that they set the tone for how the team behaves so when the team notices that when someone is giving a suggestion our leaders are considering the suggestion they are saying okay let's think about it and they see the thought process of the leaders uh then they start following the leaders and they are setting the tone and the culture and pretty soon another person starts behaving like adrian and then another and then before you know that's the culture of the team so you know having that psychological safety having people in the team who don't get triggered who don't get defensive uh that is such a huge x factor and i i want to call that out in case you are hiring people or you are putting people in positions of leadership i cannot over emphasize how crucial that is uh agent back to you yeah thanks ravi uh before we move on to that i think there's a couple of things that really contribute to that environment and uh one of the things that i know works well for me is when i understand why somebody wants me to do something or if it doesn't make sense in my mind i want to understand it so because that's a that's a hurdle for me sometimes I take the approach of trying to answer the why for a lot of people but you know during that discussion not just say hey uh do this or I want you to try this but why what is the intended outcome and what's the reasoning behind it and you know there are times when there's disagreement like maybe I had an incomplete picture and when I even after I explained the why I hear something back that makes me change my mind and I'm willing to change my mind as I gather more facts and i think the the team has seen that and uh seen that from the product owner and from our uh, other former uh, scrum master and that's the environment that we worked hard to create is to try to understand why and to hear each other's ideas and not only that but also i can say i'm i'm human i've made a mistake in the past one single no maybe more than one uh made a, a mistake one time that i'm thinking of when i asked the team to do something and uh in the interest of time I won't go into it but they were not very uh accepting of that idea and when I realized the harm that I caused I went back to them and I said look that was my intent I would like to what else can we try and maybe it doesn't have to be my idea I'm sorry I created a lot of chaos I was wrong in my approach and uh being able to say that publicly I noticed that over time it kind of changed the environment of where others were willing to say that was my bad uh I'll do better or I'll fix that. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Uh so another uh the next month in August, we noticed we were uh our number of defects was getting kind of high. Um we were working so fast, we had a goal to try to improve and try to get more done every sprint and I think quality uh 
suffered for a little bit because of these uh, number of bugs was going up. And we noticed that we were identifying more business risk. There was actually uh, a couple of deployments where we ended up with the production bug and we really do not like to have those. Uh, the team responded quickly, we were able to get it fixed quickly. There was no impact to the business, but we really wanna avoid those because we're losing the trust of our business partners, right? If every time you deploy, there's a bug, why would I want you to deploy? Uh, so we uh, went through and had a conversation. Uh, we talked about automated testing in the past. We've done a little bit of it. We weren't fully committed to it because we were just trying to get more done, right? And we're, we're trying to get um, as much value to our end users as possible. And uh, I don't think we initially agreed that automated testing was going to help that value. But when we started recognizing the increased risk, more, more of our teammates started investing in automated testing. And now in the last couple of months, August and September especially, it's become a very integral part of what we do. We've gone back and uh, done Selenium testing, uh, automated testing for previous functionality that we didn't even work on right now, but that integrates with our product. So uh, that way we're reducing uh, the risk of those production issues that we certainly don't want. And uh, it's been very effective. It's actually already helped us catch a couple of uh, issues that would have been uh, bad if they'd happened in production. So the more that we see it and trust it, I think our team is really more devoted to it. And when they see that our business partners are seeing value from automated testing, and now that we can run automated testing in like maybe two and a half minutes versus two hours of manual testing, everybody's on board with it now. Our whole team is bought in. We're reducing quality issues. We're freeing people up to do more valuable things. And it's really uh, changed the way that we do things in the last few sprints. <clears throat> One of the uh, things that we were noticing is that we have parts of our product that are uh, already in production live, and there's some part that is um, in production dark. And we were getting some technical debt in some of these areas where we said, okay, it's not breaking anything, it's not the acceptance criteria functionality, but maybe there's a cosmetic issue. Uh, like there's an extra period at the end of a sentence or something is misspelled or something, but we don't want to present that kind of image when we uh, do fully release our product to the public. And so those were considered go live showstoppers. And uh, we really made an effort to shift our thinking, not just from like a low bar of what's a, you know, deployment showstopper, but really think of, can we go live with this right now, 100% to our uh, end users? And, uh, you know, uh, initially, I think that that was causing a decrease in transparency, because now we're accumulating some bugs that we don't really uh, know when we would get to, you know, do we do it later? Do we do it now? Uh, it was also causing rework, so there's a lot of issues that come with it. And uh, we really uh, started focusing on prioritizing technical excellence. We refocused on this process that we have that we call a uh, quality review. And what that is, is really a uh, uh, two main parts to it. One is like technical excellence. What does our code look like? Is it formatted? Is there uh, things like that. And also on the functional side, making sure that we review all the functionality very thoroughly before we even go to QA. And uh, that really uh, helped us. And uh, the other thing we did is we just prioritized, went through, uh, took a, like an, a meeting for like a couple hours, maybe went through all of our bugs, determined what's a showstopper to go live and what's not and help the product owner understand what needed to be worked on. And then our dev team really, really focused on getting all of those bugs uh, completed. I think we had probably about 60 showstopper bugs about three sprints ago, and now we have zero. So it was just that um, focus on delivering a quality product for this. And we didn't want to end up like went down the road and saying that uh, we can't go live with this portion because now we need two more sprints of bug fixes or anything like that. So. 
I think that was just a good mindset shift for us. And uh, it, I think it'll continue to get better. So, you know, this is still a journey. I'm sure we'll find other challenges next month and the month after that. But all of these things helped us really uh, be more adaptable and be more responsive to our business users and deliver more value. Yeah, Adrian, I want to talk, amplify this whole quality review thing. So I want to compare and contrast the culture before Adrian introduced this quality review and after. And by the way, Adrian helped us make it a standard across the company. Prior to Adrian's quality review idea, it was every developer for himself or herself. Every developer is cutting the code. Every developer is trying to figure out how can I deploy maximum points to production? That's the, the definition of success. And then defect, we'll deal with it later. When we change the focus to excellence, then we said, okay, we're gonna have a second pair. We, we modified, Adrian helped us modify the definition of done. So an item is not done until a second pair of eyes has not only looked at the coding standards, but is making sure that did you meet the intent of the story? So now that drastically reduced the defects because you know, as Mark Norman taught me, defect prevention, let's build quality in, let's stop wasting company payroll, injecting defects, detecting defects, fixing defects, verifying defects, deploying the defect fix, right? Let's not even inject defects, right? So having the second pair of eyes uh, helped us save bank or company time and money, right? So uh, there was tremendous resistance in the beginning uh, because people said, this is going to slow me down. And it took a lot of influencing, uh, having actual experiments and having developers, Adrian recruited the developers to become the evangelists. And when developers started going to lunch and learn and saying, man, look how awesome it was. And he had some developers who are so infectiously enthusiastic. Those developers were the ones who influenced others on their team. And pretty soon they influenced the whole company. So again, this is a very big shift from an individualistic mindset about how many story points can each developer deliver to as a team, how much value can we deliver? So I just want to emphasize that. Uh, quick time check, because I hogged so much of the time, we just have a few more minutes, but I think we're getting close to the end. Yeah, well, we'll speed up a little bit. It's only got two minutes. Uh, so to recap these adjustments, basically they fall into four different buckets. Uh, stakeholder collaboration, that's really important to help us get to our goals. Um, increasing refinement, you know, increasing their engagement, and also with uh, testing and their feedback is really important. And then scrum team collaboration, not just within your team, but outside also working with the others, uh, even IT ops, to increase the skills of the team so that they can be more self-reliant. And uh, next, technical excellence, we talked a little bit about, you know, defect prevention, how to uh, fix it going forward and uh, prioritizing uh, paying off debt. So the next one is just uh, the bucket is sprint planning. The fact that we're able to do more frequent small deployments kept us from uh, creating a bottleneck in QA so that we could do a really rapid turnaround on some emergency fixes. And uh, that was really uh, critical. Uh, one of the examples is when this uh, hurricane came up. We needed a product change right away. We were able to do it in under a day. And that would have been unthinkable like five or six months ago. Um, and then uh, front loading our risk in, into each sprint is also uh, pretty influential for us. So. Very good. There's a question from Eric. How has DevOps evolved over time to enable the team cycle time reduction through this process? Uh, I think for us it's been so we, one of the things that we haven't got to yet is some of the communities that really helped us and uh, the architects were one of them. And uh, one of the hurdles that we had before was that with, we used to be very waterfall. So our deployment process was very painful. It would take hours and hours to get something ready to go to deployment. And uh, our development, our, sorry, our architects were instrumental in creating a new process in, in JIRA that was a few minutes at most, and it really uh, helped it uh, be less painful. So one of the hesitations that the dev teams were having is, why do I want to deploy more often if I have to spend two hours preparing for a deployment? And now when they can do it in minutes, that hurdle was gone. So that's been really helpful for us as well. 
I hope I answered the question. Yep, thank you. So I think what we've achieved, all of these benefits, uh, responsiveness I talked about, we talked quite a bit about quality and reliability, uh, value, delight. It's great to hear when our uh, end, uh, end users and our internal customers also say, I can't wait to use this product when we go live in a couple of weeks. And uh, team morale is the other one. I think everybody's happier, everybody collaborates more. You can just tell from daily scrum, there's more joking, people are having fun, they're having a good time. And uh, because some of those pressures were removed. So Thank the you. next slide, please. The seven communities that helped us is uh, our business uh, partners, our PO. They really supported us with testing, with being available, uh, making sure that we were building the right thing for them. Our dev team, they're so open-minded and willing to accept a challenge. Sometimes they got to think about it for a little bit, like Ravi said, and then they come back with good ideas on how to overcome it. The architects I talked about a little bit, uh, they've really been instrumental in helping our processes be more efficient and less painful. Uh, there's other, other teams, IT ops or other scrum teams that are learning to work well together in a, a rapid cycle kind of way. Uh, servant leaders and our director of agile enablement, Ravi touched on that a little bit and uh, they're always available to try to remove impediments and also as they have felt that we've increased our trust with everybody in the community. I think they've been, they've become more comfortable being less hands-on and enabling the team to self-organize and solve their own problems. CIO, C-level, Robbie touched on it a bit. We're very similar to uh, servant leaders mentality. And then our scrum masters are always learning. It's not just me, but at the bank, we have two other scrum masters and uh, they're always having a, a mentality of learning and what can we do and collaborate well, uh, together, talk about the challenges that we're facing and see if we can come up with the solutions when we, when we uh, are able to crowdsource it. All right, cool. So I think what we learned, um, align our leaders. So it's more powerful when everybody is speaking with the same message, not only the C-suite directors, our informal leaders, scrum masters, product owners, we collaborate often and talk about our goals and what we try to achieve so that we align our message. And then next is uh, establish safety to fail. That's what I've heard a lot, right? It's uh, one of the trendy terms, make it safe to fail, fail fast. But what I like to think of is actually learn fast or make it safe to learn. Because I think in my mind, you can, you can fail and not learn, but learning is what you really want. So we encourage learning and encourage picking up skills. Uh, what's really helped us get to this point also, I think is retros and continuous improvement. Our team always tries to have at least one, maybe two areas where we focus to, to improve. And then uh, making sure that we're enabling our hungry team members that are willing to go out and do things and learn and uh, collaborate. Uh, I mentioned a little while ago also, start with the why, help the team understand why we're trying to do something, why we're recommending it, and then tell them, hey, this is what we want to achieve. This is the intent, but maybe not always be prescriptive and take step one, take step two, nothing like that with, uh, with a capable team who is uh, good at self-organizing. And I think overall, all of that wraps up into enabling a culture that's conducive to collaboration and self-organization and uh, has psychological safety. And that's, that's really what's worked well for us. And uh, a lot of the credit goes to our whole team. There's ideas from everywhere. And then finally, a couple of uh, resources that I really like that I would recommend. For Scrum Masters, I think The Coaching Habit is a really good book. Uh, it really focuses on just asking some questions. They have like seven questions that, uh, the author recommends to ask. There's some that are very open and well, they're all very open-ended. One of them is what's on, what's on your mind? Tell me what's on your mind. And uh, that works wonders because then it gets, uh, it gives the other person freedom to explore whatever the, the priority is. And uh, one thing that's not in the book, but it was inspired by the book that I always ask my team is, what do you think is the right thing to do? 
and having a great team that I have and uh, very open-minded and capable people, they always get to the idea, even though they're trying to fish for another answer, maybe. <laughs> the Professional great. Product Owner by Diamond Grill, great book for product owners. I've also learned a lot from that book. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you, Ravi. And that's reminding uh, me. I hope there are some good tips and uh, somebody can uh, get some ideas going forward. I hope so too. And uh, what Adrian just reminded me of was Ken Schwaber has drilled it into all the scrum.org professional scrum trainers that the most important thing you can do as a scrum master, as an agile coach, as a scrum coach is ask the team, ask the team. We don't have all the answers. The team has the answers and it's so important to do what Adrian did. What do you think is the next best step? What do you think we should do? Uh, because that really practices self-organization because command and control thinking mental model is I have all the answer. I'm the manager, I'm the lead, I'm the coach. But servant leadership is I don't know the answers. The team knows the answers. So asking those powerful questions is so important. All right. Uh, I'm sorry we're out of time. In fact, we are over time. Please forgive me for bad time management and talking so much. I'm passionate about this. Uh, if you want for, uh, some more uh, tips on these ideas or similar compatible ideas, uh, check out our blogs, our videos. Uh, we've got a bunch of presentations and webinars. Follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, if you actually want to help us, here are some smooth apps workshops, uh, executive alignment, creating scoreboards. Uh, we have Scrum Team Quick Launch. We have the Product Owner Playbook. All of these are techniques that we've actually used at this client and many other clients. And you, as you can see, we've got uh, visible, measurable, empirically verifiable results. Uh, or we can help you with a complete agile enablement effort as well. All right. So that brings us to the end of our journey. I hope that you found this useful. I'm sorry that we went over our time box. If you have questions, contact uh, Adrian or I on LinkedIn, and we'll do the best that we can to answer as many questions as we can. Hope you found this useful. Thank you. Keep calm and scrum on. Now, Ravi and I will have a uh, retro and figure out how to stay within the time box. Uh, how, can speak, <laughs> how can I speak less? Uh, I, I'm not very optimistic. Uh, <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank night. you all. See you later.